So um, this is about trying to extend quantum mechanics to the whole universe, in which we are just some internal piece of the system. And um, like many people here, like Klaus, like many people here, but unlike others, I've been rather content with many of the challenges of doing that. So I haven't been had the same level of anxiety that some people have about that. I think a lot of things seem to work pretty well from using a sort of Everettian ever ever point of view. But I've come to the conclusion that the internal time is actually very challenging. So I'm going to provoke you about that, hopefully to lead to further discussions. And I'm also really intrigued by the issues with the Born rule that Don has recently raised. So we've had some nice introductions to internal time. And I'm just going to outline what, what I'm concerned about here. So as we've just heard this morning, we tend to divide, with internal time, we tend to divide our physical degrees of freedom up into the clock and the rest, which we try to um, look at correlations between the two. We can describe it in this way, where we have some state in superspace, which we subdivide and write in, in a subdivided system with the clock and the rest. Um, I'm choosing a discrete notation. I actually don't think that's too important, whichever way you go with that. And then the time evolution is the state of the rest that's correlated with a particular time state. So that's the that's what you do. And then it turns out to be, and so all the information about the state and the time evolution is carried in these expansion coefficients of the, of the super state and superspace in this um, direct product space. And the clock ambiguity is that you can choose another choice of clock and rest split to get any expansion coefficients you want. If I had more than eight minutes, I'd show you how. It's very simple, but I can show you if you, if you haven't already seen this. So that completely undermines. So you go choose another clock. So you can go out and do experiments and develop a standard model of electroweak physics. People get Nobel Prizes for that sort of thing and you build your wave function of the universe that describes that, and then you um, just go choose a different clock, and you get different physics out, and presumably in a world where different people win Nobel Prizes. And that seems that's a pretty radical change to how we're used to thinking about doing physics. Um, a couple of quick comments about the clock ambiguity. There's no similar issues in laboratory physics for reasons we can discuss. It's really a, a cosmological issue. Um, there are certain assumptions that go into this, which I won't emphasize in my brief amount of time. But um, either, so either the upshot is either there's something wrong about the assumptions that went into getting this result, or we actually must be able to do physics under these conditions. These are very normal assumptions in, in doing quantum cosmology. So maybe something's wrong with them. Or maybe we maybe these these assumptions are right, and we actually have to be able to do physics under these conditions. So um, that's for further discussion. Possible assumptions are wrong. This work has been out for a while, and no one's poked holes in it yet. So um, I'm getting a little more confident in this. Although it doesn't mean we won't want to abandon some of these assumptions, but there's not that part hasn't been that exciting so far. So that's a challenge if you think it should be. Um, I want to consider for a couple of minutes the case where we can do physics under these strange conditions. So here's some ideas, first of all. The idea is we, we go around looking for good clocks, and good clocks mean successful observers. So what makes a successful observer? Well, first of all, I try to, this is anthropic, but I think in a very, very weak sense, which I could elaborate on um, in, in discussion. Um, it's not really about life, it's just about a very simple feature that our universe can be regarded as, as many tiny subsystems that only interact weakly. It seems absolutely essential, an essential feature um, for us, our, our experience as observers. This is, the technical term for that is quasi-separability, Hamiltonian. It's related to locality, which we I'll always assume when we write down the Hamiltonian, we write down Hamiltonian density. Um, it um, can be related to metrics, gauge theories, finite light speed. Um, in terms of predictability, that's where um, 
the era of time and records comes in. So there's a whole group of interrelated ideas. We can go into analyzing this. So we can talk about that. Moving on from the ideas, um, there's a little calculation we've done. Suppose you just choose a clock subsystem at random. It's like choosing a, a random Hamiltonian. There's actually a whole theory of random Hamiltonians, um, starting, starting with Wigner. And we could just ask, to what extent is a random Hamiltonian equivalent to a field theory? So how well, we do, how do, well do we do at random, just pulling a random clock out, does it even look like a field theory? Well, here's what a, so let's, let's just analyze this from the point of view of the eigenvalue spectrum of the Hamiltonian. And this is the density of states of a random Hamiltonian. That's the density of states of a free field theory. And it looks like we've answered that question. They don't look at all alike. Um, but actually, let's not give up so fast. Let's, let's compare them in a region. We only ever explore the Hamiltonian in a region of eigenvalues. So let's see what happens in a region. Well, comparing order by order in a Taylor expansion, it turns out we can set the height by just choosing the size of the Hilbert space. I'm okay just doing that. We can, we can match these curves up by setting the size of the Hilbert space. Because we haven't really said what gravity is yet. We have a freedom, a shift freedom in the energy. There's no meaning, absolute meaning to energy yet in this analysis. And you can use that shift, free, shift freedom to get the next order in the Taylor expansion exact. And now, second order, they're not, they're not exact. And in fact, this is where we analyze this some range of energies probed by experiment, which leads to some error. In other words, the real physics, if, if the real physics is the random Hamiltonian, there's going to be some error when you interpret it as a field theory. And we plug some numbers in, and things might be fine, actually. So we might not be able to tell the difference. We, so our need for a local interpretation, for a separable interpretation of the world, forces us to think of it from a field theory point of view, and this analysis shows that maybe um, the real world can be set up in a way where we, we, we can have that illusion and not have noticed yet that the field theory is actually wrong. So I, I find that really exciting, and there's lots of concluding comments, but the main point is that perhaps this is very encouraging to me. Perhaps random is the most powerful foundation for our understanding of fundamental physics, which is something I've, those of you who know known my other work you know, I want to believe that from, in terms of discussing initial conditions for the universe, maybe similar sort of forces are driving, driving this um, analysis as well. For Warren Rule Crisis, I'll just say, just go to the conclusions. <laughs> um, I think there, there's a problem with, with a, trying to apply the Born Rule to um, a universe with multiple observers. And I, I'd love to talk with you about that. There's actually, it's related to a lot of interesting questions, um, spin statistics, um, clock ambiguity. And so someday, sometime on this meeting, I'd love to talk with you about this. So these are actually challenges from a quantum theory of the universe in the sense that we try to follow our noses, and we get into trouble in these two ways. And um, that's where I'll end. Great.